Dicamba injury issues that were apparent in certain regions of the country last year are becoming more pronounced in 2017. Products with dicamba could be especially useful to growers battling glyphosate-resistant weeds. Dicamba-tolerant soybeans and new approved formulations of dicamba just became available this year. But soybeans that aren't tolerant, along with several other broadleaf crops and plants, are especially sensitive to dicamba. Problems in 2016 resulted from off-label usage of older formulations, but newer versions are proving to be a challenge as well. Arkansas banned the use of dicamba in July, and Missouri briefly suspended its usage before reinstating it with added restrictions. This is unfamiliar territory in that there's no definite idea of potential yield hits due to damage. Further, crop insurance doesn't cover chemical injury, only losses from drought, flood, or other natural disasters. University of Missouri Extension weed scientist Kevin Bradley has continued to follow the issue in the south. He joined us recently to discuss injury in Missouri. Well, we, we uh, have over uh, 300,000 acres is my estimate right now that are injured uh, by dicamba, in my opinion. So it's a, it's a pretty significant issue for us. For people that haven't seen it before, can you describe what the injury looks like? Well, it, it's uh, really kind of characteristic and there are very few things that you can mistake it with, although there are some mimics and I don't want to mim minimize that. Uh, but the number one thing that dicamba will do to soybeans is you'll see this, these trifoliates that will be cupped uh, upward. And uh, it's pretty distinctive uh, if you see that, uh, you know, it's a, it's a fairly safe bet that uh, you have dicamba injury given what's going on in this country right now. Uh, the leaves can also be strapped or pulled apart, uh, you know, abnormally compared to what they usually would be. But the cupping is uh, pretty distinctive. Uh, this time of year in a lot of states, uh, you can just be driving along the road at 60 miles an hour and, and see it from the truck. So uh, it is something that shows up pretty easily. In what conditions are most of these problems occurring? Well, we've seen uh, all conditions, all stages. Uh, you know, uh, there's, there's definitely off-target movement due to just about every factor that's, that's mentioned. Uh, but if we could nail down some of the conditions that are leading to this, then we'd really have uh, some answers. And unfortunately, that's going to take some time. And I don't know how much progress we're going to be able to make on that. But that's something we're going to have to be looking at in the future. For example, you know, is it, uh, is it correlated with uh, air temperature? Is it correlated with soil temperature or moisture of some kind or lack of moisture? All of those things are, are really on our minds right now and what we're looking into. In a lot of these situations, was there a problem with wind speed or do you think it was not necessarily drift but volatilization? Can you explain the difference between that? Yeah, so uh, I've come out pretty openly and said I believe that, that all of the above are occurring. I, I think there's uh, definitely fields that have been drifted onto due to uh, improper sprayer setup or just poor decisions at the time of spraying. Uh, but I also think there are uh, numerous situations where people have done their very best and followed all the guidelines and there was no wind and yet we still have off-target movement of dicamba and uh, we've seen that for ourselves here over and over and uh, when you have entire fields that are injured uh, away from the direction of the wind at spraying uh, first of all, that's a pretty good sign that something other than physical drift occurred. Um, and so we, you know, really the, the rule rather than the exception of the fields I've been in is that they're, they're injured from one end to the other um, and no discernible difference in injury symptomology. Uh, so, you know, a lot of those I think are uh, movement through either inversions or volatility and uh, I, I think that is occurring for sure. How volatile are these newer formulations? Yeah, so that's the real question. I mean, that, that's, uh, that's going to be the question moving into 2018. Um, there's a lot of really smart weed scientists all around the country trying to answer that question right now. 
but these formulations, uh, they're marketed as, as less volatile, and I'm sure they are um, less volatile compared to some of the old standards like the Banville and, and all of that. Uh, but uh, less volatile doesn't mean not volatile. And uh, all signs, at least for 2017, in my opinion, appear to me that uh, there is volatility in these new formulations. To what extent that is causing this problem is something we're going to have to be figuring out over the next couple of months. Did I read correctly that your research indicates that some of these formulations can volatilize within 24 hours after application? Yeah, so some of the uh, kind of standard research that you would do in, in this whole arena is you make applications of these products and then you uh, go out to the field at different intervals after application and you put indicator plants out there that have never been exposed to uh, the herbicide as far as during the application. Uh, so we do that, a lot of other people do that. Uh, we've taken plants that were in, grown in the greenhouse and in the greenhouse when the application were made and 24 hours put those soybean plants out in the field uh, and uh, monitored them for a period of time and seen cupping on them uh, as much as 24 hours after the application was made. So that's a pretty good indication that uh, there is volatility occurring. Uh, the other part of the picture that you really need to be able to say that with certainty is air sampling data, and uh, we have some air sampling data that supports that same uh, statement that there is volatility occurring. So again, it's all very preliminary right now. We need to figure out uh, what amount uh, is contributing to the problem, but uh, yeah, it is concerning to say the least. Obviously, one of the biggest questions is, do we know if there's a yield decrease to soybeans that are affected by this? Yeah. That is, that's the number one question for the grower and unfortunately we can't really just, we can give you some uh, estimates and we can give you some things to think about, but uh, there's nobody that I know of that can just walk out into a field that's been injured with dicamba and say, okay, you're gonna get a 2% yield loss. Uh, I mean, there's, there's some people working on it, there's some people validating models to see if we can do that in the future. Uh, but, you know, all we can say at this point is if you have been drifted onto earlier in the season, uh, the more likely your soybeans are to recover. If you have been drifted onto at flowering or beyond, uh, the more likely you're going to have some kind of yield loss. And uh, that's about really the only statements we can make. It's, it's all about the severity of the drift after that. My final question would be, do you think this is a product that can be safely applied? I think it can, but I don't know that we figured it out yet. And uh, there's just too many unknowns. Uh, I don't know why the volatility aspect is so uh, unpredictable, uh, or maybe it's not. I don't know. We still have to learn that. But we have seen fields that you can go into, and it looks like it has stayed where it was supposed to be sprayed. Uh, but uh, again, I haven't seen a whole lot of those compared to the other. So. Why, why, is it, why is it moving is, is the number one question that has to be answered if this technology and these herbicides are going to be a part of our future in agriculture. <music>